Thank you for joining my presentation on what is the endocannabinoid system and what is its role. My name is Taryn Shenfield and by the end of this presentation you will have a good understanding of exactly how does medical marijuana work. Regrettably when you think about medical marijuana, medical marijuana you have two sides. Some people say this is the best thing to ever be sent and then some people say this is just another reason to get high. And I'm sorry to say that some of the, um, what would you call dispensaries who actually dispense medical marijuana to patients, um, they are labeling cannabis products as very attractive names. For example, they call it mango sour, or they call it purple Cindy, or they call it blue dream. And the problem with that is it's sort of, I think it leans toward the recreational side. And I have no opinion one way or the other, whether it's recreational or medical, but I am from medicine. My background is in medicine. So I think about the medicinal value of cannabis products. The most important thing to know is the ratio of THC to CBD. This is what gives the medical benefits of the plant. So example, um, you could see the Blue Dream is like 15.93% THC, but we can't see what the CBD is. So understanding ratios is what's really important. For example, you all have heard of um, the girl who, uh, Charlotte's Web, the girl who had the seizures. And what she really benefited from was a product that had a high CBD content, very low THC. Um, if someone is in pain, really having a one-to-one -one ratio, so example, 15% THC, 15% CBD might be the best benefit. I think that cannabis should not be labeled by Purple Cindy Blue Dream, but really should be labeled by the ratio of THC and CBD. And the people who work at these dispensaries really need to have a strong background on the medicinal values of cannabis products and really be able to talk to the ratio. By the end of this presentation, you're going to know a lot more than you know right now. So today's objectives on this presentation, I'm going to speak a little bit about the history of cannabis in the USA. I'm going to speak about the endocannabinoid system, and that's really the bulk of information you really need to know. I'm going to speak about what is a term called endocannabinoid deficiency. I'm going to talk about the side effects and drug-to-drug -drug interactions of the cannabis plant. And I'm also going to talk about the two main receptors being studied for medical marijuana, which is called the CB1 and CB2 receptors. We're going to have a great time today, so I hope you enjoy this presentation. So you might be asking yourself, who is Raphael Machulam? Raphael Machulam is an Israeli scientist who is considered the godfather of medical marijuana. Raphael Machulam was born in Bulgaria in the 1930s and then immigrated with his family to Israel in 1949. He studied chemistry and then received his PhD, which had a thesis on the chemistry of steroids. After postdoctoral studies at the Rockefeller Institute in New York, he was on scientific staff at the Wiseman Institute. He's also a professor at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. He moved back to Israel. And actually, he's a major scientific studier of the chemistry and pharmacology of cannabinoids. And some interesting statement. I am sure all of you have heard of THC and you've all heard of CBD. Which one did you hear about first? I'm sure, like many of us, you heard about THC. But actually, cannabidiol, CBD, was first identified by Raphael Machulam back in the 1960s. And when you really think about the plant, the medical marijuana plant, the two major constituents or chemicals in the plant, which today call cannabinoids, is THC and CBD. There are other cannabinoids, but CBD and THC are the most. And when you look at the percentage, the cannabis plant has almost 40% 
of CBD, cannabidiol, and a lower percentage of THC. So Raphael Machulam is still alive. He's in Israel. He's a pioneer in the research of medical marijuana. And you got to remember, in the United States, marijuana is considered a Schedule I drug. As a result of that, there's not much research being done on it because it's illegal. But in Israel, they don't consider marijuana a Schedule I drug, and the research has been carried out for years. So Israel as a country is probably a world leader in cannabis research. And this high guy, Raphael Machulam, is considered a godfather. He's got a big research center and they do some great research in Israel. And if you ever want to look up his name, he's like a um, wonderful guy. This slide right here will give you the strong foundation of understanding what the endocannabinoid system is. The endocannabinoid system was discovered back in the 1960s by who? Raphael Machulam. And during this time, they realized that all mammals, including humans, have these receptor sites in our body called CB1 and CB2 receptor sites. The CB1 receptor site is mostly located in the brain and the peripheral nervous system, where the CB2 receptor site is mostly found in our immune system as well as our gut. Um, the purpose of the CB1 and CB2 receptor sites is to get certain neurotransmitters or hormones attached to them in various situations. For example, when you feel sleepy, certain hormones are produced in the body. When you feel hunger, certain hormones are produced in the body. When you are in pain, there are certain neurotransmitters produced so that it could lessen the pain. So to understand this, our bodies produce two chemicals. One is called anatomide and the other one is called 2-AG. And the purpose of these chemicals is to attach to the CB1 and CB2 receptor sites. So when we produce enough of these hormones like anandamide and 2-AG, and it attaches to the CB1 and CB2 receptor sites, we are in homeostasis. So we produce enough chemical, it attaches to our receptor sites, we are perfect. The structure of CB1 and CB2 receptor sites is almost like a prostaglandin structure. And this is very important. Now, why does cannabis work? The, they found out that the molecular structure of THC is almost equivalent to anandamide and 2-AG. THC actually attaches to the CB1 and CB2 receptor site. But you really don't need ex external THC in your body if you produce enough anandamide and 2-AG. So the whole purpose here, what I'm trying to say is that our bodies have these two receptor sites. One is called the CB1. The other one is called a CB2. All mammals have it. It's not just dogs, cats, birds, whatever. And we also produce these two chemicals called anandamide and 2-AG. And when we reproduce these chemicals and they attach to the CB1, CB2 receptor site, we have what is known as homeostasis. Sometimes our bodies don't produce enough of these chemicals or they degrade. And that is why cannabis may work. As I said before, the THC molecule almost has the same molecular shape as anandamide and 2-AG, and it fits perfectly into the CB1 and CB2 receptors, actually eliciting some kind of physiologic response. And we'll get more into that later. So that is why cannabis work. Now, you may be wondering, what's the role of CBD, cannabidiol? What cannabidiol does, cannabidiol prevents the degradation of anandamide and 2-AG. So what does that mean? That means our bodies produce anandamide, our body also produces 2-AG, and when you take CBD, it prevents the degradation of those two chemicals our bodies produce and actually puts us in a better state of homeostasis, and we'll get much more into that. But that's the basics of this whole concept of the CB1, CB2, and anandamide 2-AG concept.
there's a term out there and it's called endocannabinoid deficiency. And what does that mean? Suppose our bodies don't produce enough ananamide and 2-AG. Um, that would be considered a deficiency. And in the other example of deficiency, suppose our bodies, if you're a type 1 diabetic and your body doesn't produce insulin, what do you got to do? You got to take an insulin shot because if you don't, you're gonna, your body is going to be a wreck. You're going to be way out of homeostasis. You're going to probably be very ill. So they are suspecting that many chronic diseases, as you get older, you don't produce enough inanimate, you don't produce enough 2-AG, and as a result of that, you have a deficiency and you might end up getting some chronic diseases like inflammation, arthritis, a whole host of other things going along with that. So the concept is if you use cannabis, medical cannabis, and the THC molecule could it fit perfectly in the CB1, CB2 receptors, you can actually break down that deficiency so to a point that it's better. Also, why is CBD good? CBD good for a cannabinoid deficiency because if you do produce some inanimate and you do produce some 2-AG and it degrades very quickly, if you use CBD, it prevents it from breaking down. So that is the benefit of CBD, and we're going to get more into this as we go along. So let's talk more about the CB1 and CB2 receptors. The CB1 receptor is mostly found in the brain and peripheral nervous system. The CB2 receptor is found mostly in our gut and also our immune system. It's on most of our T cells, B cells. So it has a very, very important part in immunity and also has a very, very part for inflammatory diseases and processes. So let me just say something. When you think about cannabis, people get high on cannabis. And the reason for that is THC has a strong affinity for the CB1 receptor site. And the CB1 receptor site is located in the brain. So it impacts memory, it impacts coordination, and that is why you feel high. The CB2 receptors as I was saying before, are mostly located in the immune system and gut. And a lot of times, if you use cannabis product, it's good for irritable bowel syndrome because the irritable bowel syndrome is part of the gut. And actually, there's so much knowledge out there that the CB2 receptors are very involved with inflammation processes in the body, and like irritable bowel syndrome, Crohn's disease, and also arthritis and we'll get more into that. So CB1 in the brain and peripheral nervous system, CB2 is in our immune system as well as our gut. Let me give you a little background and history of cannabis use. Um, the first recorded samples of cannabis was around 8,000 BC, and they believe that the cannabis originated from Central Asia, and they probably think it's in China. Um, early archaeological data has shown around 8,000 BC that cannabis plants, which is also known as hemp plants, actually used the fibrous materials from the stem to make cord and rope. Back around 2700 BC, the Chinese actually used the marijuana plant or the cannabis plant for medicinal uses. And you all heard of um, Chinese herbal medicine, so this is where it originates. They actually use the plant medicinally and for such conditions as pain relief and arthritis and inflammation. Then around 2000 BC, there are cases where they actually used um, cannabis for religious ceremonies. And actually, the Indians have developed their own form of herbal medicine. It's called Ayurvedic medicine. And they actually used it for pain relief and other conditions that it really works well with. There is some evidence back in 1000 AD that in the Arab world, they used hashish. Hashish is the same as cannabis. What they do is just get the pollen from the flowers, and it's a very concentrated form of cannabis. So let's go right back into 1850s, 1900s America. And then, really, cannabis was on U.S. pharmacological uh, research. They actually, uh, cannabis 
um, constituents and herbal remedies were made and doctors prescribed that for a host of reasons. And it was actually on the U.S. pharmacopoeia that all these drugs were listed. Um, at that same time, around 1937, they felt there was an influx of people who were using cannabis recreationally, and they also felt that it was un, um, it was a business that wasn't being watched over by the government. So they imposed what they called the Marijuana Tax Act, and they made it an illegal drug unless you get it. Um, it was approved by the U.S. Uh, Pharmacopeia. They took it off at that point. Then in 1996, California became the first state to actually legalize cannabis back again for medical reasons. So you can see there's a long detailed history of cannabis and I have more slides to talk about it as we move on. Now that we know the world background, let's talk about the US background with cannabis use. During the 1600s to 1890s, actually hemp production or cannabis sativa these are tall fibrous plants was encouraged. They used that material to build walls, to build carpeting, to build uh, rope and other factors they did. They actually used the seed as an oil. So it really was encouraged by the government and they farmers grew it all the time. Then in 1906, after um, the government got involved with the Marijuana Tax Act and everything like that. They created what is called the Pure Food and Drug Act, which required labeling of all hemp products. So if you sold some kind of elixir or some kind of um, medicine and it contained cannabis in it, you had to actually label it. Then around the 1900s to the 1920s, there was a great influx of Mexicans in America. And the Mexicans actually used cannabis as a recreational drug. And this soon took hold in Hollywood. All the Hollywood actors and actresses, and they started using marijuana, and they did it recreationally. So in the 1930s, because of this fear of all the Mexicans coming in using it recreationally, and all the Hollywood actors using it, um, they started really a big campaign linking cannabis use to violence and deviate behavior. They got so worried about the whole thing that um, Harry J. Aslinger was the first commissioner of the FBN, and that was created in the 1930s. The FBN is the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, now formerly known as the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency. So this is when it first started, and it was fear of the marijuana that was being used from Mexican and Hollywood actors and un under regulation. It was the under regulation, so no one was really regulating it from the U.S. government, and they became very fearful of its use. In 1932, they required what is known as the Uniform State Narcotic Act. Basically, they put the responsibility of handling cannabis use to the state, so they required each state to manage their own cannabis use. Then there was a propaganda film that was um, generated called Reefer Madness. And this film was actually created in 1936 and released. And it really demonstrated, at least on the film, how marijuana was an evil drug and it made you deviate behavior and only wackos would use it. it really, a lot of propaganda that was really not warranted in anything. Then in 1937, they created what is called the Marijuana Tax Act, and Congress labeled it the evil weed, and they only wanted to use it for medical and industrial use with their permission. Then in 1944, Mayor LaGuardia, Mayor LaGuardia was a mayor of New York City back in the 1940s, and he decided to create a panel of experts and physicians and researchers and pharmacists, and they were looking to see if marijuana was as dangerous as it was. And the report that came out was that this is not dangerous. This is not everything that's being made out of it to be. And they were in support of the legalization at that time, but they got squashed with that. Then in the 1940s, um, the 
the government decided to increase the production of hemp, so they gave the farmers the okay, and they, what they did was they used the hemp cord for World War II military equipment, such as tents, duffel bags, and different types of materials. So they, again, encouraged the U.S. farmer to start using it. Then around 1951 to 1956, the U.S. government decided to crack down on marijuana and they created these strict policies like if you were caught with one marijuana cigarette, you actually ended up getting two years in jail. Then in the 1960s, this is the counterculture generation. This is the time when you got the hippies and the free love and everyone's fighting against the government. Um, they, there was widespread use of cannabis and actually President Kennedy and President Johnson actually said that they don't think based on their knowledge and based on an expert panels that this actually leads to other drugs and violence. Then as politicians change and new, new, you get Republicans, you get Democrats, and each time you bring in a new party, you get a new policy. So in 1968, there was a creation of the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs, and this was a merger of the FBN and the Bureau, and the Bureau of Dangerous Drugs and the Food and Drug Administration. So this is the time when they really started cracking down on cannabis in the United States, and this is very close to the time that they made it a Schedule One. President Nixon decided that he wanted to investigate uh, the concept of using marijuana and the decriminalization of it. And trust me, President Nixon was not pro-cannabis. He really wanted to squash it. So he created what is known as the Schaefer Commission. The Schaefer Commission, again, was a panel of experts, of doctors, researchers, um, pharmacists, and all medical people. And what they did is they looked at how dangerous is cannabis. And from their study, they said, no, Cannabis is not that dangerous, and they presented this to Nixon, and Nixon just threw it in the garbage. He, this is not what he wanted to hear. So then in 1973, they created the Drug Enforcement Agency, also known as the DEA. Then in 1976, parents who had children who were using marijuana, which I think is correct. They, you know, children should not use marijuana unless it's for medical purposes. And they started a big movement against marijuana. Then in 1986, President Nixon, I don't want to know, I take that back. I have to, this is a typo. In 1986, President Reagan created a three strikes you're out and equated marijuana and heroin. So marijuana is a schedule one. It's in the same classification as heroin. And that is why not much research is done. It's illegal and the pharmaceutical companies don't want to put much research in it because it actually could be grown in your backyard. So in 1996, we fast forward. That was the first state in the country that actually used cannabis as medical reasons and they were the first state to be a pioneer and as you know many states followed after that. Remember I was telling you about the CB1, CB2 receptors and the cannabis um, or the cannabinoids that are being discovered like anandamide and 2-AG. So back in 1940 they first identified CBD. So think about it. CBD was identified in the 1940s. And then in 1964, they actually identified THC. Then in 1988, they identified the CB1 receptor. The CB1 receptor is the receptor that's in the brain. And then they actually cloned that receptor in 1990 to do some research. And then in 1992, uh, Raphael Machulam actually discovered the chemicals that our bodies produce, anatomide, and then in 1995, he, they actually discovered 2-AG. So anatomide and 2-AG were identified in 1992, 1995, and these are the chemicals that are produced in our body naturally that attach to the CB1 and CB2 receptors. And then in 2001, they had a discovery of the retroglyph 
excuse me, they had the discovery of the retrograde signaling, which is how it actually fires in the synapses of the brain. And that's a little bit of a neurological pathophysiology, and I'll get a little bit into that. The receptor site, the CB1 and CB2 receptor sites that the anandamide and 2-AG attach to, and remember, THC actually attaches to that same receptor site. That's why it has such a strong physiologic response, are called um, G-protein-coupled receptor sites. These are pretty well-known receptor sites in the body, and the CB1 receptor site is located mostly in the brain, the peripheral nervous system, some fat cells, the liver, the duodenum, and also muscle tissue. And the CB2 um, receptor sites are mostly in lymphocytes, such as macrophages and cytokines. So this is where the actually receptor site is for receiving 2-AG and anandamide as well as THC. And you really have to understand a little bit about this physiology. This image talks about the signaling processes of the cannabis and THC and 2-AG, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. On the top part of this, you have the presynaptic neuron. On the bottom, you have what is known as a postsynaptic neuron, right? And the CB1 and CB2 receptors are on the presynaptic neuron right here and right here. And what happens is, as a signal is firing from the presynaptic to postsynaptic, sometimes this firing can cause pain. It can also create um, neurological disorders and so on. So the body would naturally release anandamide and 2-AG. So it would be released from the postsynaptic neuron, and it would actually go back in, and it would calm it down. Sometimes we don't produce enough 2-AG and anandamide, and as a result, the firing keeps on going across. And this is what, like how epilepsy works and different types of disorders, pain modulation, so many different inflammation. I could, it's a whole host of things that go along with it. But when you introduce cannabis into the system, it actually plugs in the uh, presynaptic neurons around here, around here, around here, and it stops the firing. It stops that uh, firing that's actually causing all kinds of problems with you. So that's what they talk about, the role of the presynaptic neuron and the postsynaptic neuron. And remember, the CB1, CB2 receptors are mostly on the presynaptic neuron, and the postsynaptic neuron is where the 2-AG and the nanomite is produced. So what's the role of CBD? It stops the degradation of anandamide and 2-AG. It, has, it does not attach to the presynaptic neuron, the CB1 or CB2 receptors. So that's the role of it. So I wanted to give you an overall again. So let's talk about it. The endocannabinoid system is in all mammals. Everything has, including humans. It's been there for millennium. I don't know how many years, you know, for, for millennium. The CB1 receptors are mostly located in the brain and the peripheral nervous system, and they have a high affinity for THC. That is why when someone uses cannabis to, and they have THC in it, it attaches to the CB1 receptors and can have consequences in regard to memory, uh, could have a coordination, and so on. The CB2 receptors are mostly found in the immune system. And again, they have an affinity for THC, but not as high as CBD. Uh, so our bodies produce two cannabinoids. One is um, anandamide and 2-AG, and they attach to the CB1 and CB2 receptors. And they, have, they control a lot of processes in the body. They want to keep you in homeostasis. They have a key role in hunger, fat accumulation, glucose and lipid metabolism, pain modulation, inflammation. There's a whole list. That's why cannabis works on all of these different areas. Uh, the well-known receptors are the CB1, CB2, and our bodies produce the two, two endocannabinoids naturally, which is called anandamide and 2-AG. Sometimes our bodies produce enzymes that degrade anandamide and 2-AG. That's why we have known as an endocannabinoid deficiency. And that's why if you use cannabis, it just fills the plug 
to say, you know, in so many words. Um, also, the role of CBD is that that, that enzyme degradation of 2, 2-AG and anandamide is reduced with CBD. So it actually enhances what your natural systems are. So let's talk more about the cannabinoid receptors. You have the CB1, you have the CB2. The CB1 receptor, which is part of the, it's in the brain and peripheral nervous system, has a high affinity for THC. Actually, many of the processes of cannabis are improved with the CB1 receptor, especially in the brain. Pain, nausea, depression is all part of the CB1 receptors, arthritis, lupus for the inflammatory processes there. Also, the CB2 receptors are mostly part of our immune system, and there's a great density of them found in our GI tract right around our stomach. That is why cannabis is used to modulate Crohn's disease and irritable bowel syndrome. It actually attaches the THC and it attaches to the CB2 receptors in the gut and actually decreases the inflammation. Let's talk about the CB1 receptor and in particular, its physiologic effects. The CB1 receptor actually regulates so many different parts of our body. Number one, it regulates energy intake. There's some new research going out there that they're actually using blockade of the CB1 receptor to improve glucose and lipid metabolism. In other words, you could treat diabetes. Actually, the CB1 receptor has, when you have pain and pain signaling from the neurons which involving the CB1 receptor, actually the use of cannabis can actually reduce pain. That's why one of the uses of cannabis is in mild to moderate pain. But at the same time, it attaches to the CB1 receptors in the brain and it impacts certain parts of our body in particular our brain. The brain controls our motor control, it controls our memory and learning, and as a result of that, if you use cannabis, it can impact your memory short term, it can impact your balance and how you walk. Um, other benefits in de deal with your inflammatory process. A lot of times the CB1 receptor is in involved with immunity and inflammatory responses, and it's also involved with neuroprotection. So if some, state, some patients who have epilepsy or have some patients who have actually other neurological diseases benefit that, including anxiety. CBD is wonderful for anxiety. THC has a high affinity for the CB1 receptor. The CB1 receptor is located at different parts of our brain. For example, the basal ganglia, which controls motor control, the cerebellum, which controls coordination, the hippocampus, which controls memory and learning, all of these are impacted by the CB1 receptor, especially when someone uses cannabis, the THC actually connects to that. And so you have transient um, loss of memory, loss of coordination, you know, nothing critical, but, you know, it does impact it. Um, in regard to the amygdala, that has a lot to do with anxiety, where the spinal cord has a lot to do with pain modulation, and actually the brainstem has a lot to do with vomiting. Um, cannabis has been shown to work very well for patients who are on chemotherapy because it stops them from vomiting. It actually stimulates their appetite, and that is one of the approved diagnoses of getting medical marijuana, um, the fact that you vomit and the fact that it could trigger, uh, increase your appetite. I'm not going to get too much into this because I think I explained this already, but the CB1 receptor actually exists on the axon terminal rather than the postsynaptic cell. And it affects different neurotransmitters in the brain because it could populate that receptor site. So it could impact the release of acetylcholine, dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin, glutamate, and GABA. Um, increasing GABA actually is a calming effect and serotonin is a calming effect. And so it really impacts a lot of different physiologic neurotransmitters in the body. And they're doing a lot of research right now. They don't know all the answers, but they're getting there. Let's talk about the role of the CB2 receptor. The CB2 receptor is mostly located in the immune system, very little in the brain. It's also in the spleen, the tonsils, and the thymus gland. Um, 
The real power of the CB2 receptor is it modulates inflammatory responses. When you think about inflammatory responses, think of arthritis, think of Crohn's disease, think of irritable bowel syndrome, think of Alzheimer's disease. All of these things are due to inflammation. And the role of the CB2 receptor is key to managing these and modulating these different sources in the body. Let's talk about the CB2 receptor and pain. There's a lot of research going along with the CB2 receptor because it inhibits the transmission of pain without CNS effects. Basically what that means is it gives you all the pain modulation that morphine gives, but not but doesn't cross over to the brain barrier. As a result of that, you know, you don't have a lot of ill effects. I will say that it's very good for certain types of pain. It's not good for acute pain. So it appears to modulate um, more chronic inflammatory pain. So with arthritic pain, um, if you have some kind of sore muscle, it's good for that. It's also good for post-surgical pain and it's good for cancer pain. And it's also good for neuropathic pains that involve nerve injury. So the, a lot of the research goes there for these type of pain modulations and it works very well. But I know I have acute pain on there, but I don't think acute pain is part of the process that it works best. Morphine has its value too and other um, anti-inflammatory pain relievers also work very well. Let's talk about the role of CBD. Um, I have a whole other PowerPoint that I took all about CBD, so this is just mentioned briefly. Um, CBD has a very low affinity for the CB1 and CB2 receptors, so it does not attach to the CB1 and CB2 receptors like THC does. It actually acts as an antagonist on these sites. So what it really does, it actually extends the duration of anandamide and 2-AG. Remember, anandamide and 2-AG are two chemicals that our bodies produce naturally that attach to the CB1 and CB2 receptors. It also extends the duration of effect of THC. So if you have THC in your body, it actually extends the use of it. So some of the common reasons why we use CBD is Dravet syndrome. Actually, the FDA just approved a new drug for Dravet syndrome, which is a um, epileptic type of seizures for children. It's also good for other forms of resistant epilepsies. It's good for mild to moderate pain. It's good for cancer pain. It's good for um, nausea. And it's very good for inflammation. So inflammation comes in the form of arthritis and different types of characteristics like that. So CBD is really good. One thing CBD is really, really good for is helps with anxiety, number one. And number two, it helps you with sleep. Um, CBD actually works in reverse to THC. So in other words, if you feel the anxiety that THC can cause, which THC will cause anxiety, the CBD counters that. But in regard to if you have any kind of anxiety issue, CBD is your go-to. There is so much work being done on the CB1 receptor. And like I said, in America, um, cannabis is a schedule one drug. It's very illegal. So a lot of pharmaceutical companies don't want to do research. But um, they're currently, as more states are actually introducing medical marijuana, they want to do more research on the CB1 receptors. And they have been looking at different mechanisms where it works. For example, with the hypothalamus, um, they've actually found that it impacts food intake and appetite. And they're thinking the clinical implication for that could be um, weight loss. Another thing is... Um, people who have liver disease and they actually found that it could decrease lipogenesis which really has a lot to do with fatty livers um they also from the gi tract that uh, they looked at it actually impacts um satiety signals basically these are the signals that make you feel full and they think it has a big potential with weight loss so they're doing a lot of research with the CB1 receptors, and they're finding that cannabis has all of these type of um, 
regulatory mechanisms going there because like I said, our bodies have CB1 receptors, CB2 receptors. We naturally produce these two inanim two chemicals, anandamides called anandamide and 2-AG, and cannabis has the same molecular structure, so it impacts the same kind of physiologic response. In summary, we are just starting to do some real good research on the endocannabinoid system. I'm glad now you have a further understanding what the endocannabinoid system is. Um, they're believing that cannabis research is going to impact many chronic diseases because we have endocannabinoid deficiency as we get older. Our bodies don't produce enough anandamide and 2-AG, and as, as a result, we have chronic disorders. So maybe the use of cannabis may help us. And also, they need to do more research because currently it's still a Schedule One, but because some states are allowing medical marijuana and even recreational marijuana, more studies are being done. But they're not really being done by the pharmaceutical companies who want to really make everything synthetically. They want to actually, in a, in a dish, make a in a test tube. They want to make uh, medications that you could use that may be derived from the chemical structure of cannabis, but it's not. And there's so much new stuff coming out in the future, and I really thank you for joining me today, and I hope you learned a lot about it, and I'm here to answer any of your questions. There's a lot of good information out there if you really want to understand how cannabis works, and one of the first places I would tell you to start looking is what is the endocannabinoid system. You really got to get a strong background on that. And uh, remember Raphael Machulam, he is the godfather of cannabis research, and there's so much to learn there, and we can learn from him. So I hope that you indulge in learning more. The more you learn, the better you'll be. And, you know, when I think about the use of medical marijuana, I know there's like a double-edged sword. Some people are thinking about it recreationally. You got your advocates that way. Um, I come from the medical side, and if this medicine can work and if this plant can work for you for a host of medical conditions, I'm 100% for it.